We're about to say a whole lot about approximating the area under a curve using rectangles, but before we dive into that, I wanted to motivate a little bit why we're going to talk so much about using these rectangles and trying to find the area under these curves. So let's start with the antiderivative. Specifically, let's start with an initial value problem that gives us velocity. So say we know that the velocity v of t is 2t as a velocity function. And we have an initial condition of position s of 0 equals 0. So this is a nice initial value problem, and we know that we should be able to find the position at any time t given this information. Well, let's do it. Let's take the antiderivative or the integral of this velocity. So s of t will then be the integral of velocity, the antiderivative is what we've called it, of 2t dt. Right, we integrate up, we get uh, 2t squared over 2, of course, which is simply t squared. Uh, plus c. Plus c, that's important here. So that's t squared plus c. Okay, now we pull out our initial condition, s of 0 equals 0. s of 0, well if we pl plug in 0 for t, we get 0 plus c, and we know that whole thing equals 0, which happily tells us that c is 0. Thus, we now have our final position function, s of t is t squared. Okay, so this is good. And now we can ask questions like, how far does the object travel in 4 seconds? And we can answer that by taking s of 4. Okay, well s of 4 is 4 squared, so 16 units, maybe meters or something like that. Okay. What does this have to do with areas under curves? Well, let's try something different. Let's try graphing this velocity function and looking at the area under it. And this is very fundamental to what we're going to do moving forward. Okay, so we're plotting time on the x-axis there and velocity up here. And this function is 2t, so it's just going to be a very steep line. We can put some units in here, maybe 1, 2, 3, 4. And at 4, we're going to go all the way up to 8, which I'll put here. Okay, so now we have at least a point, and we can complete our line. So what we computed above is called the displacement. So this s of 4, that's the displacement between 0 and 4. Back to our sketch here, we'll, we're still looking at the time between 0 and 4 down here on the, the I guess, t-axis, we'll call it. But... My question is, what's the area under this curve here? So if I computed and shaded this whole region and computed that area, what would we get? Well, of course, this makes a triangle. And we know what the area of a triangle is. 1 half base times height. OK, well, 1 half, the base is 4, and the height is 8, which is 16. Same thing. So this is incredible. What we've stumbled across here is called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, which essentially tells us that the antiderivative and the area under the curve are the same. Now, of course, we'll find a much more mathy way of saying it, but essentially that's what we're looking at. So just so we don't lose the forest for the trees here, what we're going to do is build up a ton of theory based on the area under a curve. Then we'll go on to say that area under the curve is the same as the integral. So what we're really doing is building up theory so that our integral becomes more and more powerful. Because there's not much we can do with an antiderivative, but there's a whole lot we can do with geometry of areas under curves. So we're about to take a tour through geometry and do more with rectangles than you ever thought you would ever possibly do. But let's not lose sight of why we're doing it. We're working towards a robust theory of integration. Well, you may say, that's all good for triangles, but what if our velocity function was not a straight line? So say we had some curve f of x, and we wanted to estimate the area beneath it, say between a and b here. And the idea here, and we'll say a lot about this, is you can take rectangles, 
So let's take some big chunky rectangles. Let's, let's divide this into three chunks here. All right, so you can take these rectangles and use these because we can very easily calculate the area under a rectangle. Well, that one's kind of a weird slanted rectangle, but you get the idea. Whoops, that one went a little far. Okay, so here we have our three rectangles. We could easily find these areas, A1, A2, A3. Then we add them up to get the total area under the curve, when in this case would be, well, approximately equal to A1 plus A2 plus A3. Now, perhaps you agree that that would give an estimation and it wouldn't be very good. Well, how could we get a better estimation? Well, let's add in more and more rectangles, right? So instead of just doing three, right, we can get rid of these horrible things. Whoops, overkill. And um, think, and maybe add in a bunch more. Maybe we add in smaller and smaller and smaller rectangles here. And of course, as we do this, our approximation will get better and better and better, right? And I won't draw these all out and so on. The more rectangles we have, the better this approximation under the curve is going to be. But this is calculus after all. So how many rectangles do you think we're going to have eventually? Of course, we're going to have an infinite number of infinitely thin rectangles. That's the limit. And that will give us the exact area under the curve and thus the exact integral. And everything will come together quite nicely. So that's where we're headed. That's why we're going to talk so much about rectangles in the upcoming sections. Let's try a concrete example. Okay, so this example says the velocity in feet per second of an object moving along a line is given by V equals F of T on the interval zero less than or equal to T is less than or equal to six. So what that's saying is this function here, it's actually the same function on both of these. Uh, this is our velocity function. And here we have, of course, time going from zero to six in both cases. Okay, t is measured in seconds. Part A says divide the interval from 0 to 6 into n equals 3 subintervals. 0 to 2, 2 to 4, and 4 to 6. All right, we can do that. In fact, it looks like they've already done it for us here in Part A. So we have this one, this one, and this one. We're just chunking this thing out under this curve to make these rectangles. Okay, then it says on each subinterval, assume the object moves at a constant velocity equal to the value v evaluated at the left endpoint of the subinterval. And use these approximations to estimate the displacement of the object on 0 to 6. Okay, what in the world? Well, the, the key word here is left endpoint. Because when we make these rectangles, we need to know how high to make them. And if we could use the left endpoint here, we make this little rectangle under this. But if we were to use the right endpoint from 0 to 2, we'd make a much bigger rectangle up here. Right? So you have to very specifically specify whether you're using right endpoints or left endpoints or even midpoints or something else. In this case, we're using left endpoints. Okay, well, we're estimating the displacement. Displacement is given by the area under the curve. Okay, so let's do it. We're back to, I don't know, some kind of elementary school or middle school or something where we find the areas of these rectangles. We have three rectangles here. We're just going to add them up. Okay, so we can call this A1, A2, and A3. I don't even know if that's necessary. That's probably overkill. But then area total for part A here is A1 plus A2 plus A3. Okay, well, the area of 1 is base times height, 2 times 10, 2 times 10, plus the area of rectangle 2. Well, the base is still 2. Note the base is the same for all these, and that'll be a common theme as we move forward. So the base is still 2, but now the height is 40. So 40 there. And rectangle 3, the base is still 2, and the height is, looks like 70. 70. All right, well, that gives us 20 plus 80 plus 140. You'll have a lot of just adding things up like this in these exercises. Um, how about 240? And this is for part A here, so let's be very clear. Let's finish it out. The displacement 
is 240 feet. 240 feet. How did I know it was feet? We go back up here to where velocity is given in feet per second, so then displacement must be in feet. Okay, on to part B. It says repeat part A for n equals 6 subintervals. Okay, so now we have the same curve, but now we have 6 rectangles below it. Okay, well we can deal with this. Now we have our total area is equal to the sum of the areas of those 6 rectangles created under the curve here. Right, so we're going to add up each of these areas. Um, here we go, one at a time, right? But we can do that all day, right? We know how to find the areas of a rectangle. What's the base of each of these going to be? Well, the base is one for each of these. We're going from zero to six, and we have six of them. So the base is always one. And a quick way to find that, we call this, we call this value here, just to introduce some notation, delta x. And delta x, we'll just go up here, delta x is always the endpoints b minus a, over n. And we'll see this calculation a lot. Okay, so b and a are the endpoints, in this case 0 and 6, and n is the number of rectangles. So we could even use this here. So we'd have 6 minus 0, because we're stopping at 6 and starting at 0, over n, well we have 6 rectangles, well, that tells us that delta x equals 1, which is what we know down here, delta x equals 1, 1, 1. Okay, so We'll use that delta x notation extensively. Okay, well, let's just add them up. It can get a little tedious, but area of 1 is base 1 times height 10, plus area 2, base 1 times height 20, plus area 3, base 1 times height 40, plus area 4, base 1 times height 60 plus 5, base 1 times height, looks like 70, plus number 6, base is 1, height is 80. Okay, add these all up, and we get a displacement of 280 feet. Now, which do you think is more accurate? And I hope you're saying part B, 280 feet, is more accurate. Part A was a really terrible approximation, right? Three chunky rectangles kind of stuck under this curve, whereas Part B, you could, we're at least trying, right? We have a much better kind of fit under this curve, and you can imagine as we did more and more rectangles, right, this would get better and better and better. Okay, so the more rectangles we have, the better our approximation becomes, and it becomes the exact area when we let the number of rectangles go to infinity. An infinite number of infinitely small rectangles gives us the exact area under the curve.